Uh, so my paper today will explore the phenomenon of comforts funds, um, which emerged during the First World War to provide warm clothing, food and tobacco to British and colonial troops. And this convention continued during the Second World War and in both conflicts relied upon the cooperation of the state, voluntary organisations and tobacco firms to make the effective provision of cigarettes and other tobacco products possible. And today I'll focus in particular on contemporary notions, particularly during the First World War, of soldierly welfare and the incorporation of tobacco and the social cultural activity of smoking in stressful and dangerous battle situations during the First World War, as well as in periods of pre-battle anxiety and post-violence relief. So as the Berkshire News, um, a, a newspaper based in the English on the English borders with Scotland, um, in their tobacco fund stating, uh, their tobacco fund advertisement um, of 1917 stated during um, the conflict of course itself, that tobacco was the only comfort for soldiers in the trenches. Its mild narcotic properties were seen as vital in encouraging resilience, combating nerves and preventing boredom. Indeed, as tobacco supplies ran short in the summer of 1917, this pleading article, accompanied by an image of disabled soldiers with their nurse carers, stated that tobacco um, made a soldier's life worth living. No matter the circumstances, to Tommy, a fag is always everything. The article, essentially a promotion for this tobacco fund, went on to outline the many intoxicating spaces inhabited by servicemen. And it said this, we want to send smokes to the men in the front line, to the brave fellows in billets taking a well-earned rest a, a little behind the front line, but still exposed to nerve wracking shell fire. And we want to send smokes to the wounded heroes in the dressing stations, the ambulance trains and the base hospitals. We feel that our readers only require to be told the true condition of affairs to cause them to rally round us in a manner worthy of the cause and worthy of the splendid lads who never grouse or grumble and ask only for the comfort of a smoke, need we say more. And two years earlier, in May 1915, the Worthing Gazette, and that's a town on the south coast of England, underlined some of the most commonly cited reasons for tobacco consumption in wartime, as well as underlining the patriotic role civilians could play in ensuring ready supplies of the weed. And it said this, Tommy smokes most when he fights hardest. A pipe or cigarette seems to make him cool under fire, more determined than ever to see it through. It comforts him as nothing else can when after the battle, he finds his head splitting with the din and fumes of the conflict or perhaps lying wounded in a trench or field. There isn't a Britisher, but wants to do his little bit. Here is one practical opportunity. We cannot all go to the front but we can help make more tolerable and more comfortable the lives of the brave fellows who are there. If our own boys, the lads from our own district, are to be kept supplied with these necessities for their solace and comforts, we want regular contributions. The tobacco was therefore simultaneously a luxury and a necessity, leading to its inclusion in comforts funds organised by humanitarian relief organisations, such as the British Red Cross as well as in funds established by local working class community groups and war charities. So the, my central contention today is that smoking and the provision of tobacco was deemed central to soldierly welfare by many wartime voluntary workers, medical practitioners, commentators, businessmen and politicians. As such, the extensive supply chains and interactions between the state commercial actors and voluntary groups will be assessed. Alongside consideration of the spatial dimensions of wartime tobacco consumption, within conflict zones. So I want to begin by establishing a little bit the context of cigarette consumption during the First World War, underlining why this conflict was particularly important in driving the proliferation of and growing popularity of the cigarette as a particular form of tobacco consumption. So firstly, the early 20th century saw a boom in the popularity of cigarettes because it was now possible to produce them on industrial scale. So meaning that a mass market was required to match the economies of scale that were now possible. So the invention of the first automated cigarette making machine in 1880, uh, patented by the American inventor James Albert Bonsack, revolutionized the tobacco market, 
So many more cigarettes could now be produced as production by hand was now obsolete. 120,000 cigarettes could now be produced during a 10 hour shift. That's 200 per minute. One of these machines was obtained by the British firm WD and H.O. Wills of Bristol in 1884. So much of British uh, smoking culture in the late 19th century was focused around the pipe and the middle-class tobacco connoisseur. Pre-mechanisation, the tobacco market was consumer-led and pluralistic. Brands were marketed to suit the particular lifestyles of their customers, with names often related to taste or cultural markers of status. Brands often reflected the specific markets manufacturers were aiming to appease. So tobaccos were branded with names that reflected their taste for a discerning, generally middle-class customer. For more working-class tastes, uh, brands reflected the hardy and no-nonsense attitude of working men. Uh, as, as Matthew Hilton describes it, smokers stressed the liberal virtues of independence and individuality in their consumption practices, and a highly segmented and specialist industry offered a diverse range of goods to cater for a wide variety of tastes. So in this market, um, in the late 19th century, cigarettes held only really a tiny share. But by 1919, 51% of tobacco consumption in the United Kingdom was in the form of cigarettes. At the beginning of the 20th century, this stood only at 10%. So we can see here that there was a massive increase in cigarette consumption during the First World War. And it's difficult to ignore the correlation between the conflict and the popularity of the now mass-produced cigarette. So this is the context. And while the Bonsac machine had made um, mass production possible, um, there, there was a need to find this mass market um, for the cheap cigarette. Um, and, you know, as Matthew Hilton has noted, um, in order to realise the economies of scale um, that the Bonzac machine made possible, there needed to be a mass demand found. And this was encouraged through advertising. And visual advertising, of course, was not um, new in the late 19th century, early 20th century. It was already a very common sight on British high streets and in newspapers before the onset of the First World War. And in the early 20th century, the images used by tobacco manufacturers increasingly focused on the lowest common denominator possible, so as not to alienate any portion of the market. And commonly, this meant allusions to imperial conquest and grandeur and the use of patriotic symbols. So you can see uh, pre-war, um, so this is a pre-war example from the Navy Cup brand, uh, where in, uh, naval and military heroes in these examples are foregrounded. Um, this one, you can see this kind of like very masculine looking uh, sailor with very large hands. I always, I always remark upon that. Um, and in a wartime example, we've got a more topical example um, of military culture being um, shown. It's uh, showing a, a brand new hydroplane. And you can see that both the chaps in the plane have cigarettes in their mouths. And this tendency reached something of a pinnacle during the First World War, as martial and imperial images lent themselves well to both civilian and military mobilization. So these were images that could associate tobacco consumption with patriotic service and often with notions of resilience. Naval and military themes permeate wartime advertising, updating the martial imperial values stressed in the pre-war context for the actual conflict itself. So if you even include, this is in, even included uh, shifts in advertising that consciously elided clear meanings in order to be open to as large a market as possible. And this was really the case with Carreras' uh, Black Cat brand, you know, the Black, the Black Cat itself having very little to do with the cigarette product itself. So while in 1910, as these examples show, the Black Cat demonstrated the good value of the product for the reader and for the consumer, in 1915, the same motif had donned a military uniform and was fighting against unfair profits and high prices. He also often enjoyed a smoke himself with a cheerful sailor, or literally beat his drum for the famously jingoistic and avidly anti-German John Bull periodical. And Black Cat continued in this tradition in the 1940s in the Second World War with, a, with what I can see, what I've described as a kind of Disney-fied version of the Black Cat. And um, you can see the, the visual culture shifting somewhat, but this perceived need to send cigarettes to the front was still there in the Second World War. 
And black cat was also used to promote anti-German messages. So a set of collectible cigarette cards depicting German atrocity cartoons of the Dutch artist Louis Raymakers was released in 1916. And around this time, exhibitions of his work were being held around the world. So many of the gruesome images were reproduced in newspapers alongside belligerent invective on the need to avenge the cruelty and wickedness of, the Germ of Germany as a nation, as it was put. And this included depictions of the wounded, uh, of gassed soldiers, as you can see here, atrocities against civilians and symbolic images of death that condemned Germany as a brutal racialized other. The manufacturers, the manufacturers boast that, boasted that this was, quote, the most historic and valuable set of pictures ever issued as a gift. Very understated there. Then there was the figure of the Tommy, of course, the ultimate mass man. This was ideal for marketing cigarettes during this period as he embodied both ideas of the nation and the mass nature of the conflict. Invoking Tommy in any number of ways could connect the product with patriotism while underlining the importance of smoking to the fighting man. So for example, Woodbines were held to be Tommy's favorite fag as it was put in advertisements, thereby encouraging consumers to associate themselves with this heroic and patriotic figure. Navy Cut's hero character, and um, you can see here in the, at the bottom, fulfilled a similar role. And in the case on the, in the right here, you can literally see a depiction of a, cig uh, of, a, of a man made of cigarettes, a soldier made of cigarettes. So these are absolutely fundamental to his being. So while the act of smoking could be associated with patriotic duty and war service, the vast machinery of charitable civilian mobilization took part in furthering the spread of cigarette consumption through tobacco funds and comforts funds. In some cases, these funds had the official backing of the state and military authorities and were able to organize a vast logistical operation to distribute hundreds of thousands of cigarettes to troops fighting abroad. This also included the loosening of tax duty upon tobacco purchases for funds with official approval. And one of these official funds was the um, smokes for wounded soldiers fund and that fag day poster on the left is from that particular fund. Following the establishment of the War Charities Act in 1916, many funds and organizing bodies related to smoking were officially registered. Um, but most commonly the focus of these funds was cigarettes, although food and clothing and other comforts could be included. Up until this point, charitable efforts had been considerable, but were not coordinated, and so oversupply was a recurrent problem. And this effort was extended enormously during the war. It involved the organization of events like Fag Days, which was a play on words for, for the, the Flag Day um, organization, uh, charitable and solidarity kind of events that happened throughout the war. But most towns and cities during the war in Britain had their own comforts funds, usually connected to newspapers, friendly societies or already established charitable bodies. Some were set up in response to a perceived comforts crisis, as many increasingly saw the government's efforts to provide warm clothing as inadequate. The organisation of local funds was also connected to ideas of sacrifice and civic pride, as evidenced by some local newspaper advertisements for their own funds, and you can see some here. Some funds were general in scope with names such as the Primitive Methodist Sailors and Soldiers Comfort Fund and based upon already existing bodies like churches. Others responded directly to the apparent need for more cigarettes in particular. Stockton on Tees in the northeast of England had the Soldiers and Sailors Smokes and Comforts Fund, while Hessel near Hull in East Yorkshire had the Hessel Soldiers Tobacco Fund. And many funds were headquartered in pubs social and sports clubs, underlining a high degree of working class involvement in charitable tobacco giving in a context often assumed to be the preserve of middle class people. As I've found in my research in Great Britain, out of 154 tobacco focused charitable comforts funds registered under the 1916 War Charities Act, 53 were based in pubs or inns, that's 34% of the total. And in some regions, including Warwickshire and the West Riding of Yorkshire, the majority were organized from this base. So this charitable organization was actually very effective at distributing comforts. Uh, and the, the distribution of cigarettes far outweighed any other item provided, including medical equipment. 
This amounted to more than 230 million cigarettes during the span of the conflict. Up until the end of 1916, a fund in Southampton in the south of England for returning wounded servicemen had distributed more than 2 million cigarettes alone, in addition to 5,000 packets of loose tobacco and 5,000 pipes. So there's a bit of an insight here into the popularity of cigarette smoking among service personnel and its perceived essential status as a special need, as it was put, of those on the front lines. But what about the perspectives of medical practitioners and military authorities? The contemporary debates about the potential negative effects of smoking were elided by the foremost British medical journal, The Lancet, in October 1914 to underline its special status. And they said, we may surely brush aside much prejudice against the use of tobacco when we consider what a source of comfort it is to the sailor and soldier engaged in the nerve wracking campaign. Tobacco must be a real solace and joy when he can find time for his well earned indulgence. Indeed, as Fiona Reed has noted, early 20th century doctors were already aware of the addictive properties of nicotine with excessive consumption linked to the development of heart defects. However, the popularity of smoking coupled with its assumed soothing properties when in stressful situations, and this was a view shared by a considerable constituency of medical practitioners. This meant that smoking was one of, uh, and this is what Reed says, smoking was uh, the one area of self-medication which neither the military nor the medical authorities attempted to police, not in any real way anywhere. In October 1916, for a correspondent to the editor of the Times, using the nom de plume MD, so a medical doctor, any negative effects tobacco could have on the body were far outweighed by its positive effects on morale. Tobacco was a panacea, um, really for the damaging excesses of modern war. And this correspondent said, uh, um, tobacco at the front has a moral value which simply cannot be ignored. And it may be asked whether any ill effects it possesses are equal to or even comparable with the ill effects of shock and strain and stress, which cannot be eliminated and which tobacco does so much to mitigate. And tobacco was a panacea precisely because its application was perceived as necessary in almost all the imaginable settings embodied by wartime experience on and off the battlefield. It was essential during long periods of attrition on the battlefront as a means of recreation when waiting for action. And then it was similarly prized as a salve for frayed nerves after a battle had passed. So it was essential to soldiers convalescing in hospitals away from the front. And again, this possessed a similar social psychological quasi medical quality. And the cigarette, of course, was perfectly suited to wartime conditions. As Richard Klein has written, the act of smoking allowed the smoker to master a moment in time, to momentarily escape the horrific and dehumanizing conditions of the trenches, of a situation that's seemingly out of one's control. It provided a space for uh, individual contemplation and focus, as well as for distraction. So the cigarette was useful in, in, in the intoxicating space of the trenches, particularly the conditions that trench warfare um, enabled. This small tube of paper, whether manually rolled or received from a manufactured pack, was easier to consume and preserve in the ever-changing, ever-shifting conditions of trench life. Now coming towards the end now, just in case I'm um, running quite close to time, just to let you know. So these material conditions had a real impact. According to official estimates, over 96% of British servicemen were smokers by the end of 1914, and domestic consumption steadily rose year on year during the war. The habit was helped on its way by the provision of tobacco and cigarettes in soldiers' ration packs, in a move that surprised the tobacco industry early on in the conflict, as such a luxury item had not been provided on this scale before. As the Tobacco Trade Review commented in September 1914, hitherto the government has not shown evidence of providing anything in the nature of luxuries for Mr. Thomas, Tommy Atkins, when he has been an active service. But apparently the authorities have now formed the opinion that the soldier requires something more than fighting machinery and food. And the daily ration at this time consisted of two ounces of capstan tobacco direct from the manufacturer Wills of Bristol. And this dwarfed the French ration of 20 grams or 0.8 ounces and the German provision of 
two cigars and two cigarettes per day. Um, though this latter offer was more varied because the Germans generally got a little bit more choice in what they could use. Some, some had snuff and loose tobacco uh, in greater quantities. And among the troops of all belligerents, the choice of tobacco really reflected the smoking culture of each nation, as you might expect. But really, the, Brit the British soldiers had really had the most. Um, oh, quick there. So I want to make a few con concluding points just to finish off. Though, of course, there's very much more I could say, and we, well, I'm hope we'll have we'll have some time in the questions to to maybe talk about this some more. So the 19th and early 20th centuries saw the rise of the cigarette made possible by technological innovations in production. This led to unprecedented economies of scale and a mass market was found for tobacco products with the cheap mass produced cigarette predominating in Britain by the onset of the First World War. The war itself presented ideal conditions for the promotion of the cheerful smoking habit, which many saw including medical practitioners as vital to military morale and soldierly well-being under fire. War was instrumental in cementing and furthering trends in civilian and military tobacco consumption that had been underway really since the late 19th century. It sped up the process, arguably. Indeed, as recent medical and public health research has shown, smoking continues to be higher among military personnel than in the general population. There remains a semblance, perhaps, of the culture of smoking in the military, of using the weed as a salve for frayed nerves because the perceived need for this medicinal intoxicant has not really gone away. Therefore, I might hesitate to conclude that militarized spaces tend to also be intoxicating spaces. And I think it's a good point to end on that and hand over to the next speaker. So thank you. <laughs>